when I think about racism as individual, as systemic, as political, as structural, as historical. Um, and all of that kind of collides again and again in events, in my research, in the classroom. Um, which I think is a good thing. Um, a way that we can appreciate the infinite uniqueness of our own complexities. Which I think is also a problem that sustains racism. That we're all too quick to uh, move towards the most simplest answer rather than uh, grow and nurture our appreciations for these kinds of complexities among us that implicate us, uh, that make us complicit in some of these systems. Uh, but if we, I think at times if we think more about our complicity as a starting point, then it's not about you're the bigot and you're to blame. And it's this guy over here and that over there. Yeah. I don't know, that's some bio and then some other stuff. <laughs> that's a pretty good start. So I'm going to fast forward to today when <coughs> apparently the President of the United States is going to declare a national emergency around a non-existent caravan of immigrants or refugees headed to the southern border. And the notion of what's happening with populism and xenophobia and all of the craziness that we tend to depict as a problem that is south of our border, but in many respects is percolating here in, in uh, many of the same but perhaps more subtle ways. And I'm a kid who grew up as a middle class white kid in Westdale who, when I was in the seventh grade, family moved to small town Ohio. And uh, I distinctly remember walking into the middle school cafeteria the first day and looking at one side of the cafeteria being all black faces and the other side being all white and I knew exactly where I was expected to be. Mm -hmm. And that experience where the history of race in the United States has been so much more explicit and, and um, informs everything from neighborhoods to religious affiliations to political parties as opposed to a Canadian context where in my experience many of the same things manifest here, but they're perhaps more politely dealt with or not acknowledged. Can you talk to us about the, the very real challenges that your research has identified about systemic racism in this country and maybe reflect on how it's different or similar to what we're seeing playing out in the U.S. right now? Mm -hmm. I am... Um, I, I do a lot of archival research, and some of that right now is in Hamilton, um, but in the past it's, it's been around how we think about forms of, of racism and colonial technologies and practices within disciplines, inside policy and law, and that we carry around. And um, there was a time where I sat with documents in archives, dusty documents. They were in boxes. They're not digitized yet. They're still, you still have to request a room full of boxes and then go process them. And most of them were around the early 1900s. Uh, in Canada, there were House of Commons debates um, around some rising threat to the Canadian race. That, that was the, the language they were using. And the debate was that there was some impending doom coming with a rise of immigration. That there was a threat to uh, employment, there was a threat to the composition of Canada. And the way they articulated that was under a big notion of undesirability. That immigrants were somehow, some immigrants, mostly from the Global South if they were allowed here, but at the time it was mostly uh, people from Eastern Europe, uh, people of Irish descent, uh, people who were Italian, um, that immigrants were carriers of hereditary defectiveness. And this included criminality, uh, any kind of deviance in terms of sexual orientation, 
um, any kind of political affiliations that had to do with communism, all packaged together. And it's an interesting thing to read because it shows up in our Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, well before it was that, in the Immigration Act as, um, in 1910 as prohibited classes mm -hmm. altogether. And I used some of those as artifacts to be like, look at how we used to think about immigrants as threat. And now I don't need any of that at all. Right. I, can, I can use um, CNN or uh, a newspaper from yesterday to show the same sentiments, the same ideas that particular kinds of bodies are somehow lower on a human hierarchy, deserving of violence, less deserving of respect, um, and undeserving of any kind of care, uh, which is a, a really disturbing kind of thing. Um, Hamilton has its own unique history about how we think about race, I was sitting with an archive around uh, an incident that happened in 1930 in Oakville around a break-in and the Ku Klux Klan was called upon to address the issue. And it, and a it delegation from Hamilton right. made its way to Oakville to settle right, right. the score, right? And, and the gentleman who was accused uh, took a position of, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not black, I'm indigenous. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what made the newspaper. And it was such a strange mm -hmm. time, a strange thing. Uh, where people relied on that. And some of the other research uh, has to do with where I live, on Hat Street. Samuel Hat bought and sold slaves in Canada. Actually, uh, a woman named Sophia Pooley was sold by Samuel Hat to Joseph Brandt, the, uh, the Mohawk leader, which also complicates things That's quite a bit. Um, so all of this stuff, these kind of nation building, national identity, supremacist ideas mm -hmm. and complex histories of how we relate to each other in space all frame how we absorb, encounter, and react to the kinds of things that we see um, more overtly now. But many of them are here. It depends on your own proximity to them and how you experienced racism in your life. If you're a black, indigenous person of color, none of this is new to you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, let me grab that for a minute. Because yeah. um, what I want to do is invite the audience to jump in. But I am conscious we have a planner in our midst, uh, Mary Lou. And, and the other place historically that's played itself out is, is of course, around planning. Uh, and, and one of the ones that I always, as a former West End counselor a million years ago, like to cite is the historic covenant on title in West End of no, no, uh, no Jews, no blacks, no foreign-born Western European people could own property, right? And that remained on title at least until the late 50s, and it's part of our history that we don't often talk about. So uh, with that, I'm going to jump. Which shrinking violent in this audience wants to start the conversation and uh, challenge Emil or ask him a question? Ken Stone, go ahead. Um, Professor Emil, I believe you applied for a position on the Hamilton Police Service It's, it's my third time applying. Um, well, you would think that the board and the city would want someone who, who has some knowledge around racism and systemic racism within policy and law, that has some expertise um, in, in legal research that has to do with colonial uh, artifacts as they make their way into practice. I study uh, both criminal justice and mental health and immigration policy and law. Um, so I thought I was a good candidate. I thought maybe they could they could use me. And uh, I'm not blind to the, the issues in Hamilton around police, around carting and street checks um, as they continue to um, target racialized groups, carrying on f particular forms of anti-black racism, targeting indigenous communities, um, also stratified in terms of gender and class and sexual orientation. 
particular at-risk um, areas. And I think about how that idea of, of certain groups being the threat, being the burden, being the carriers or those who embody lack, as the same as how I think about undesirability and pro prohibited classes and how those kinds of things arose out of nation building practices and these kinds of things. Um, so I put myself to bring that perspective to the, to the police board. I've never received any kind of correspondence back about you were looked at, considered, sorry, try again next time. They don't even reply to me. Um, and there's been a couple of ways to apply. There used to be an uh, online um, central registry that happened um, through government. Council. Right? And, and then um, this time it was, it was a paper application that you brought into the clerk. Mm. Uh, but nada. But I'm going to continue to apply. I'm going to apply every time there's an opening. Uh, until I hear something back. Um, and I'm thinking about writing something about it as well, uh, about this process. I wonder if others who apply receive the same sort of silence um, and how I'm considered or ranked amongst the applicants. Good question. I, I, I hope I got some kind of answer for you. Let me go back to the audience. You want to just give us your name and fire away? Uh, my name is Chris. Um, I'm not sure if this is covered under your, I, I guess, understanding or purview of your research, but I'm curious how the and uh, the planning question kind of reminded me about this. How, I, you know, it's always been common for for certain racial groups and ethnic groups to kind of coalesce into one area. You know, for example, like China, Chinatown in Toronto or, or Portugal Town or what, what, what have you. Um, but I'm curious, th with the recent uh, influx of immigration and a lot of certain cities having uh, a large portion of a certain type of population, does that improve the situation for them in their own cultural group and as the ca in the Canadian context? Or does having, you know, cultural areas kind of hurt their, um, their idea in the, the greater scheme of things? Does that... You know, is is the idea that like Brampton is a is a city of, of immigrants or Mississauga or, or what have you? Is that healthy for for those people that move here to kind of be around their you know people that they can talk to and and, and kind of learn how how they you know fit in, or is that you know harmful in some way to the the larger cultural uh, you know idea? I think um, it. A lot of my perspective on it comes from my proximity to experiences with immigration. My parents, in particular. Um, and there's an idea that it's individual choice. That um, newcomers, immigrants, refugees have some say in where we are distributed where we are allowed to be and how we integrate or not. And these are either failures of ours or choices of ours, that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of that just isn't the case. Um, sometimes people are uh, offered uh, an assortment of places to go, so high demand cities for refugees, uh, already allocated places, um, and a lot of times it depends on income People have been traveling for months, sometimes years, sometimes detained at different areas along the trip. Um, and they, they move towards the most affordable places. Sometimes people, because of the barriers we build in society, uh, people have to do things that are uh, for the care of themselves and their families so that they can survive. And sometimes that means uh, congregating around at least that which is familiar to you. So you have access to the foods that you know, um, some families that can support you. I know uh, our family, 
there were a few brothers and sisters, siblings that came over together. They all lived in a subsidized housing unit where they had a few units together and they would kind of pool incomes to support one another. Why that is, is because of systemic and structural issues that under supported them when they got here, that left them on their own to like survive, make it or, or break it, sink or swim. Um, and and all, some of that had to do with language, some of that had to do with documents, some of that had to do with access to employment, some of that has to do with affordable housing. Um, and at the time, uh, access to uh, certain lines of employment were, were more prevalent. Uh, you know, my, my mom used to say, we used to walk into a factory and say, do you have a job for me? And they'd be, You're s you could start on Friday if you like. And that was kind of it. Um, at, th at the same time, um, you know, newcomers, immigrants, refugees were relied upon for um, types of labor, forms of labor um, that were attached to jobs that were the least protected. Um, so they were more at risk for harms in the workplace, um, not having access to protections, and if something bad happened to you, you could easily lose your job and sometimes lose your place in Canada, be forcibly removed. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's really complex how you think about it. Um, I think we have to listen to the dominant sentiment. Is it the dominant discourse that, you know, people are congregating amongst themselves and that's what's causing racism? Because they're not being um, amenable to integration. Whereas everything I know about tells me that's, that's the opposite. It's more so the circumstances that people are placed in that restrict their access <laughs> to inclusion. Yeah, based on old ideas. Yeah. Let's go back to the, the audience. Helen Sadowski. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, just generally racism. Do you think that it's increasing in our neighborhoods? Um, you know, we see the manifestation in, in Hamilton in front of City Hall, you know, social media. Um, yes and yes, I, and well, also it depends on how we think about racism. So very often we're talk, taught and reminded that racism is about individual bigots with biases and prejudice that carry it, and that is where it exists and how it becomes systemic, that then we carry these things into practices, so our workplaces, doctor's offices, and, th and then make decisions via policy and law. So the way to address that is by, you know, diversity training, un unconscious bias training, these kinds of things. But if you also acknowledge that it doesn't have to be that on its own, that we might have held these beliefs a long time ago that were divorced from their project, and now they're embedded in their entire disciplines and professions and ways of doing things in society that now carry those technologies and practices. And then we embedded those things in policy and law. The Immigration Act was the example that I used earlier. And so we practice racism on a daily basis. And not all of it depends on our bigotry. Um, but all you have to do is scratch the surface and shake the bucket and the values and ideas that drive the way we relate to each other on racist ground will bring up the more overt uh, sentiments that exist. And you'll get your more um, radical, more heinous uh, forms of hatred. So yes, um, you know, when particular leaders just say overtly racist things, it does give license. And when people poke um, old reasons, old things to blame, 
Uh, it does the thing of scratching the surface and shaking the bucket to rattle up what people call dog whistle politics. Okay. You know, um, just going to use that. You know, if you say the right thing, you can yep. kind of provoke that sentiment. Um, but we do, we have seen, people are reluctant to say it's a rise because it's always been there. At the same time, it's worse. It's yeah. worse, yeah. Nice. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, it strikes me. I, I had a fundraising letter from a national political party come through my door a couple of weeks ago that explicitly used dog whistle politics around ISIS, the threat of terrorism in our midst, and a sea of people crossing the border illegally. And I thought, I've, I've come to almost expect that from American political discourse, but it's still jarring when it happens in this country. doesn't mean that when you scratch the surface, it wasn't there, but to have leaders of uh, mainstream political parties use that kind of rhetoric as a, as a point of division and of energizing a political base, it's, it's rather frightening in my estimation. I'm going to go back. Yep. Can you just identify yourself? Oh, sorry. I'm CA. Yep. Uh, I'm at the Nakasa in the Oxford Community Engagement. And I, so to hear, to hear you talk about what you know from your lived experience and from your research um, about systemic racism and how all of these things are embedded in professions like policing, how do you as an individual navigate getting stopped on the 74th time? Like, how do you... Yeah, good question. I think um, I would I would talk to my family about it, and I had older cousins that had been through it. My dad had stories about how he dealt with it. My my partner Liz um, had never experienced any of it, and I remember one of the first times we drove across the border, um, she saw what happened to me, and I looked over, and she was just in tears. And I was like, I for me, it was just kind of a, I knew what to do. Um, I had my documents ready and 14 other documents and my hands on the wheel. And, you know, I answered questions promptly. I didn't stumble. I, I kind of averted my gaze to not look intimidating. All things you learn mm -hmm. to behave unthreatening. Um, and I, I learned to do that so you don't get killed really, um, or arrested, you know, or charged. And it always looks, it's always messy. Like I remember just answering the question wrong with my cousins and they pulled us out of the car, and smacked us on the curb and stepped on our necks. It was just, it, it can go there very quickly. So you learn how to kind of protect yourself and other people help you learn that to protect you. It's like a way the community kind of has mm -hmm. learned to protect themselves. And at the same time, I saw people who were fed up, who didn't do the thing that I did, which was comply. And I'm not recommending doing what I did. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, they, they paid a price. Mm -hmm. And those are the some, some of the forms of resistance we see online, um, where people are that, like lashing out because it's their 74th time. And what we see is, hey, there's person X being mm -hmm. someone who deserves that, and that's what they got, right? It's a funny snippet, which is completely ahistorical. Right. Yeah. <coughs> uh, my name's Wes. Uh, as a student, and from your perspective, as a student of the social evolution, are we making progress? Are we retrogressive or are we progressive? And if not, what can we do to move forward? I, I think um, there's, there's definitely struggle happening now. That is both um, the world reacting to what happens when the dog whistle sounded, 
and us trying to integrate um, a critique, an analysis, sets of knowledge and experiences that did come to exist in relation to all this stuff that we're seeing kind of rise again to the surface. I do feel, both in social media, in the classroom, in my research, that people are listening to um, more diverse analyses in terms of critique. That the language of intersectionality means something to people more broadly than it did when I was coming up. And how we think about contributions from black feminists, how we attend to colonialism and indigeneity, how we think about ability and disability, and how these things are kind of connected. Uh, when we think about you know, transphobia and um, gender and sexual orientation and kind of like, for me, they historically run together when we're trying to create a society around an idealized type for a particular uh, industrial purpose. Um, so say we, we do know those things and then we're colliding with this other stuff. Is that progress? I don't know. I think it could be. I think maybe there is one of the many things that is happening um, is that there is this collision of where we've come in terms of knowledge and the stuff we never dealt with. This is that collision point. And uh, I, I don't think of it as progress, like kind of moving upwards, because it could go either way. Uh, we could very much elect um, a Doug Ford <laughs> who takes away and pulls things down. A and then it's difficult to kind of use knowledge and experience and research to build uh, when you're constantly working to just rebuild. So I, I am mindful of time. We probably got time for two or three more. So we're not going to cut off the discussion. And <coughs> we're obviously going to continue thereafter in smaller groups or individually if you want to ask questions. But I, I, I'm going to kind of start to wind it down. And your hand is up. So you're going to, no, don't look back. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Evelyn. Um, this thing with bigotry and systems has been coming up with a lot of people in my life. And uh, you know, a lot of people right now are still in the mode is as long as we treat everybody with respect and kindness, that's what's gonna get rid of racism. And I think like, for me, that kind of equates to watching someone getting beaten up by a bully and just being nice to the, the victim of the bully, but never addressing the, the person in that, those, that could be like the prison system, or it could just even be Hamilton, which is a colonial project. Um, and then considering this, this talk is called dismantling white supremacy. Um, I'm always interested in talks like this where um, I'm just curious, like, what, what do you think the role of reforming um, the system of capitalism or even like the city of Hamilton, of like, what, what is the role in that in really looking at these parts of racism that are embedded in the systems that have created the institutions that we know today or the, the neighborhoods that we've known today? And what, what's the role in, and what's, what are the limitations and maybe what are the, um, I don't know, what are the pros as well? That's a big question. <laughs> right. Um, so if we, if we take an object like policing, um, there were many who have argued that because capitalism is tied to colonialism, which is tied to the idea that there are types of humans that are not humans who are deserving of exploitation. You always had to rationalize those who we could hurt in order to take. And that happens internationally. It happens domestically. That thing continues. That piece of the structure, some argue, if we destroy that somehow, then capitalism can't exist as it is. There, there is no system to exploit. So you can't make these metrics of growth that we all depend on to, for survival 
that run how we relate to one another. And then these apparatus like police aren't necessary to enforce those class racial distinctions that are, are necessary for the exploitation system to continue, for the machine to exist. So what's the alternative? Um, and what are, where a lot of people are going is either individual or they're thinking historical. So uh, in black studies, uh, people are kind of excavating, but not, because it was always there, we just didn't read it. Yeah. You know, Ronaldo Walcott talks about black studies as a, a fugitive discipline that smuggled its way into the university, and they didn't want it there. And now, it's transformative. And you know, you see it in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's how we smuggle these things into the places we need them to be smuggled, smuggled in so that they can be in transformative. They can't just be bodies around old tables carrying on the old machinery. They have to bring with them the analysis that critiques. Uh, so that we can both transform things from the inside and pull things down that we don't want uh, while having a kind of meta critique of how all of this is sustained in a very troublesome, problematic way. I, I could, like, if, you, if everybody wants to cozy up and we could sit down for another three hours or so, <laughs> we could probably pull some of this apart. I'm going to be happy to do it, but uh, hopefully that's some, something I'm going to answer here. Actually, You've uh, prompted a memory for me because a lifetime ago I chaired the police service board in this town. And uh, it was at a time when there was a change in provincial government, the entire slate of the board got turned over uh, and, and some voices different than those that traditionally had been on the board actually arrived there. And one of the interesting um, traditions that I encountered right off the bat as the chair of the board was that historically the board, which is the oversight civilian body that is supposed to hold policing to account, had their own badges. And that only ended when a member of city council flashed the badge at a cabbie who had the audacity to interrupt his journey along a residential street and was charged with impersonating a police officer. And <laughs> we quickly dispensed with the tradition of the badges. But the notion of what possible good can come from having a civilian armed with a police badge when, in fact, they're expected to be the oversight, not a civilian arm of, of policing. I mean, it just, and that wasn't that long ago. You know, so it, it, the notion of changes to institutions, especially paramilitary ones, is, is complicated and will not come without substantial pushback. Um, we have time for a couple of more questions. So, Mary um, Lou Tanner. Yes, so I'm an urban planner, uh, but I work for the city of Burlington in a different role. A long time ago, former colleagues from McMaster wrote a book called State Apparatus, and it was about the deinstitutionalization of psychiatric patients and the geographic implications. And the studies were founded in Hamilton. And it seems to me in listening to what you said that so much of how we invest in cities and disinvest as well, because that is also a choice, is also founded in the historical state apparatus and the Immigration Act and the values of separating. And Terry talked about zoning, but I just wonder if there are, in listening to you, if so much of our policy on how we build cities is now founded in our history and it's not a good history. Absolutely. Um, I would, uh, this is also warrants a, a three-hour response. <laughs> uh, there's a guy named Michel Foucault, wrote Madness of Civilization, History of Sexuality. Talks about, um, you know, the rise of industrialization, kind of emergence of capitalism, the need for cities to be a certain way and to organize in order to re reproduce a certain subject, subjects. So certain families had to exist to reproduce themselves, to make a working class, and to deal with undesirables. This is where you had the rise of the asylum and you know ways to put people on a mountain, uh, ways to mark off 
immigrant labor pools, ways to deal with people that weren't fitting. Um, and a lot of municipalities are based on that design, that industrial design, that Eurocentric industrial design. But it's not the only way to live. What I was alluding to before was this excavation of other kinds of knowledge, other kinds of relations, indigenous ways of knowing, ways that were where we tried to erase forms of knowledge that are thousands of years old, where people related to each other in different ways. Um, I think we can try to believe that there's other ways of, of being and relating to one another and organizing how we live um, that aren't so supremacist in nature. Like We honestly believe that the way we design cities sometimes is based on the best knowledge, the most current knowledge, the most robust uh, and eclectic knowledge, and that in order to move forward, we rely on that base and, and kind of add to it, rather than all of this was built, like you say, on really problematic ground, and we need to start somewhere else. Uh, and to do so doesn't depend on us gentrifying better um, or, or remarking boundaries or fighting neighborhood associations around NIMBY laws. Those are good battles to have, but they're not structural in how they change, how we relate to one another, how we plan. So there's something of an answer. Yeah. Alyssa, last question to you. Um, my name is Alyssa Lai. I work for McMaster University. Um, I think about this a lot because I have a lot of Anglophone friends who feel a sense of guilt when it comes to conversations and discussions about racism and discrimination. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about what kind of advice would you give to us racialized folks on how we broach conversations with a lot of Anglophone friends who couldn't fathom the kinds of issues that you face on a day-to-day -day basis, but have a respectful and thoughtful conversation in a way that encourages us to think about, you know, where we might find common ground in some of this thinking. Um, I often try to practice uh, confronting my complicity in, in systems of dominance that hurt people, um, that are tied to systems of oppression and, and use that as an entry point. Um, you know, when I was talking about the colonial history in Guyana, it's not um, divorced from uh, racial hierarchy. Um, you know, after um, Guyana gained independence in the 60s, um, there's government documents now, but the CIA, the West, was um, very interested in making sure that people breaking for free from colonial rule to not move towards communism. Um, and so they were very interested in supplanting leaders that were um, pro-capitalist, pro-West. And so what happened in Guyana, that was done along racial lines. And so anti-black racism is Im was embedded in the 60s and 70s and onwards uh, in politics. Um, and you know, being of South Asian descent, I was on the end that was given a privileged position from colonial days. Uh, and I struggle with that, and I think about it openly as an entry point, not from guilt, but to think about complicity and how those structures maintain social relations in the West Indian community now. I think about me working with a mental health organization that was basically surveilling people of color in marginalized communities and blaming them for social, historical, political ills. That's how I entered this field. It's from complicity. I think if we begin there, then it's not like, hey, I'm not to blame. I didn't know. Like, I didn't do any of this. I didn't set all this up. That's not the entry point for me. That does nothing for us. Um, so I think sometimes um, being honest about where we begin uh, can open up conversations that engage with historical complexities that we live the realities of, that we deserve, rather than these kind of tweet polarities that we see um, all too often.
Thank you. By the way, <laughs> I, I do have a bone to pick with your institution. Alyssa used to work for us at the uh, Community Foundation. She now works at the University. Celeste Licorice until this week worked at the Community Foundation. She's now moved to the University. Is there any other of our talent that you <laughs> intend on stealing in the All next little? Um, let me on behalf of, first of all, the Community Foundation, I need to say a couple of thank yous um, to Michael Parente, who is sitting to my right and who has helped to bring this thing together, um, acknowledge his uh, support and service and great job he's done. Um, for those who are not familiar with us, there are a bunch of our staff, uh, uh, who's here? Grace Diffie is here, Celeste Licorice, Alan Enriquez. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think, who, who else is here? Rose. Rose Taylor Wheel is here. She's off to England in another month or two. Everybody's flying the coop from our, we'll be recruiting for anybody that's uh, <laughs> looking for a job. Um, we're grateful for your contributions and your willingness to be involved. Um, I do want to highlight that next month we do lots of educational events at the beautifully restored Westdale Theater. We have a, uh, a workshop a dialogue on affordable housing in Hamilton. We hope you'll be able to join us. But mostly today, I want to ask you to join me in thanking Emil Joseph, professor, for his wisdom, for his honesty, for his candor, and for the challenge he's thrown out to each of us as Hamiltonians to make this a better and a, a more inclusive place. Thank you so much for being with us. Tonight.